Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. We're really thrilled today to have Dr. Brian Garibaldi with us from Johns Hopkins. Uh, Brian actually, uh, I had the chance to meet Brian about four years ago at the Stanford Clinical Skills Symposium. I was just really, really impressed with his dedication to advancing the physical examination, clinical skills at bedside, cultivating the next generation of physicians. Uh, Brian has really accomplished, since I, since I met him, he actually is has become the co-president of the Society of Bedside Medicine, newly formed in 2017, uh, and he has really accomplished quite a lot uh, throughout his career. He graduated from Johns Hopkins Medical School back in 2004, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and he went on to do his residency, uh, chief residency and fellowship there in pulmonary critical care. Uh, subsequent to that, he actually most recently uh, had a um, uh, completed a master's of, uh, of uh, health professions education at uh, the School of Education at Hopkins. Uh, and that was in 2018. Uh, throughout this time, he's really been very accomplished throughout a variety of realms. Uh, he, on the clinical side, he actually is a, uh, he focuses on interstitial lung disease in his clinic, attends in the ICU, he attends on the, uh, the general medicine OSLR teaching service there as well. Uh, and he, um, he actually helped to create the, uh, uh, the, the biocontainment unit at Hopkins that uh, responded to the Ebola crisis of 2014. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, now he's actually in a variety of different teaching roles at Hopkins. He's actually the um, associate program director for their residency program there, uh, focusing really on clinical uh, skills that he'll talk with you about today. Uh, and throughout those roles, he's also achieved multiple grants, publications in education, uh, focused on promoting the physical exam uh, and clinical skills at bedside. Uh, we've had him with us for the last day. It's been really a pleasure to get his advice on our own programs here. Uh, see a wonderful demonstration yesterday of teaching physical examination. Uh, and we're really looking forward to his presentation on resuscitating the, the physical exam or the clinical exam. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. So it's been a, it's been a great couple of days here. I've really enjoyed meeting all the faculty residents and, and uh, chief residents. Um, you guys have a wonderful program and tradition in bedside medicine here. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today is, is the work that we've been doing to resuscitate the bedside clinical examination. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the current state of the physical exam. We're going to identify some of the challenges and opportunities uh, with our time at the bedside. And then I'm going to go over five strategies that we've employed at Hopkins and now through the Society of Bedside Medicine to try to revive the bedside clinical examination. I don't have any disclosures, but we are going to use poll everywhere. So I don't know if you guys can see this. If you want to participate in the poll, if you text uh, to 22333, it's my name, it's B Garibaldi143. I couldn't pay for the premium plan to get my own like super fun name. So and I'll keep this up for a couple other slides. So what I wanted to do is start out with a quote by Sir William Oster that I heard when I was a medical student back in 2000, and I really tried to model my career after this. Medicine is learned by the bedside and not in the classroom. Let not your conceptions of disease come from words heard in the lecture room or read from a book. See, and then reason and compare and control, but see first. And this is the iconic picture of Osler engaging in the cardinal maneuvers of bedside medicine. So he's inspecting, he's palpating and percussing, he's auscultating, and finally, perhaps the most important, he's contemplating. But we know that this is not happening in the modern hospital. There are studies of physicians, and most importantly of our trainees, that show they spend only about 12% of their time in direct contact with patients and their families. And if you look at our house staff, that averages out to about six minutes per patient per day. And so I wanted to ask you, in your practice, what are the greatest barriers to spending time with your patients at the bedside? And again, so if you text B Garibaldi143 to 22333, you can sort of free text your response. And we'll give this like 10 or 15 seconds to work. If not, we'll keep going. I know like two people in the audience, so I can pick on them. Chris, text something. 
Okay, so we see the EHR, right? Early discharge pressure, charting, patience. Huh. Okay, we should talk about that one. Um, well, we're, we're seeing a lot of similar themes here. The electronic health record, time, pressures, throughput, those types of things. You know, if Osa was going to visit the modern hospital today, this is what he would see, right? Our trainees and, and all of us physicians, we spend on average about 60% of our time in front of a computer screen, right? Then when we do that, it's not surprising that fundamental skills that can only be practiced at the bedside are in decline. And so this is one study that was developed by John Michael Crowley, who was a cardiology fellow at Hopkins in the 50s and then went on to a long career at, at uh, UCLA. And this is a, a cardiovascular test that has videos of patients that are coupled with heart sounds recordings. You can move the stethoscope around. You can look at the neck and the chest um, as you're examining this patient. And what he's shown is that on the x-axis here is the year you graduated from medical school, and the y-axis is your score in the test. And over the last 50 years, not surprisingly, it's a straight line down. And this comes with consequence, right? If, if our skills are declining, this adversely affects patient care. So the National Academy of Medicine is very much interested in the issue of diagnostic error. It's estimated that there's over 18 million diagnostic errors that happen every year, and that most of us in this room will probably experience a diagnostic error in our lifetime in our own healthcare. And when you begin to unpack where these errors are happening, there are some studies that show that up to 50% of errors are mistakes in the physical examination. And when you further look at those mistakes, the most common mistake is simply that the exam was never performed. Um, and that's a huge problem. But in addition to the diagnostic problem of declining skills, I think we all recognize that there's a power and a connection that comes with spending time with patients at the bedside. We know that a physical exam done well can have a placebo effect. But the converse is also probably true. A physical exam done poorly or not done at all can, can adversely impact that doctor-patient relationship. But it's even more than that. I think many of us believe that as we've spent less time with patients at the bedside, this has led to a sense of depersonalization and burnout or a lack of meaning in our work. And so I do think that this impacts the rising threat of burnout, particularly among trainees. You know, By some estimates, 70% of our trainees are burnt out. And that burnout starts third year of medical school, which is ironically the same time that we're supposed to start spending time with patients. And so it's in that environment that we decided to re-examine the way that we approach physical exam teaching at Johns Hopkins. And over the last few years, we've come up with five things that I want to share with you that has helped us reinvigorate our own practice as faculty in the physical exam, but also has helped our trainees, I think, to reappreciate the time that we spend with patients. So I'm going to start by thinking about the physical exam as an evidence-based test. And so one of the, the problems when we talk to people about the physical exam is that the diagnostic standards for many things have changed over time. So this is an idealized version of where the diagnostic standards lay back in Osler's time, right? The vast majority of what we did happened at the bedside. Osler himself probably died from a post-influenza empyema, and he never had a chest x-ray. He had a bedside thoracentesis attempted, but he never had what at that time was becoming more available. Um, but if you look at what happens today, most diagnostic standards, and many of them, are somehow based in technology. And this has led to the false assumption that if it's not a technology-based test, then it's not as valid or as reliable as that which we see, hear, feel, touch. And we don't really do this anymore with taste, right? I mean, that was hundreds of years ago. That was one of the things that we would do. So what, what is this? Shingles, right? You knew that right away. There's nothing else that you need to do. You don't need to do any other diagnostic test. I suppose you could do a, a Zank smear, but you don't have to, right? You knew right away what that was. But there, and there are many things in medicine that still rely on that which you do, that which you see at the bedside. So a lot of dermatology, a ton of neurology, musculoskeletal, even some cardiology. We don't have to go through all of these, but there's still value. The only test that you can do at the bedside is your physical examination to make that diagnosis. The other thing that's important to recognize is when you look at the reliability of tests, just because it's technology doesn't mean it's better. Right? So if we use the Kappa score, which is one way of looking at inner rate of reliability, where a Kappa score of zero is two people don't agree, they, they just agree that the finding is there by chance alone, and a score of one would be perfect agreement, we tend to think that 0.75 is really good, but 0.4 is acceptable. Here's a list of some common physical exam signs. Um, so, percussing the liver span, 
um, greater than nine centimeters has horrible interray reliability. And that actually has to do with how hard you percuss. If you percuss harder, your liver span will actually shrink. So you're pretty good going from patient A to patient B and saying this patient's liver is bigger than that patient. But if Chris and I go to the bedside and I say it's 10 and he says it's 15, who knows, right? So it's not a good test. But things like determining if someone's got a long or short systolic murmur, determining if someone's hypotensive, those have great interrate reliability and we rely on those tests all the time. But let's look at some quote unquote gold standard tests. Right, and this is the one, that, the top one is the one that scares me the most. So the classification of coronary artery lesions in a cath lab, the interrate reliability is only 0.33. Right, so that means that you could be in a cath lab at Hopkins and a cath lab at Wake Forest with the same anatomy, the same lesions, and you can come to a completely different decision about what you're going to do for that particular patient. Right? So just because it's an imaging-based test or a technology-based test doesn't make it better. The other thing that's important to remember is that the physical exam is not just about diagnosis. It allows you to make decisions about prognosis and response to treatment. And this is still valid today. So this is from the Paradigm HF trial that just came out about two weeks ago, looking at different medications for the treatment of heart failure, as ACE inhibitors versus neprilysin inhibitors. And you can see here at every clinic visit, they looked at the physical exam and they looked at four things. They looked at whether or not the person had edema, do they have jugular venous pressure elevation? Did they have crackles? And did they have an S3? And they looked at those four findings. You can see here for all of the outcomes, the increasing number of those findings predicted that outcome. They predicted heart cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, all cause mortality. And this is in a huge trial where they're doing highly advanced echoes, they're doing biomarkers. The physical exam performed just as good as any of those other tests. So it's important to remember that it's still valuable. And one of, the, one of the reasons that I think we've lost sight of the use of the physical exam as a test is that we don't teach it like any other diagnostic test, right? We go to medical school and we have a day on the head and neck exam. We have a day on the abdominal examination, but we do that without context. We do that without talking about how that actually helps decision making. We don't talk about pretest probability and how that physical exam finding is going to change your, your diagnostic likelihoods, right? And so we don't use it as a test. Right? We don't approach it as a test, but it is. And so we teach something called the hypothesis-driven physical examination where you have, you have to start out by determining the pretest probability. And if, I don't have time to go through all the derivations of this, but simply if you knew the prevalence of disease, that would be your pretest probability. But there's a lot of nuance to that, right? I work in a pulmonary fibrosis clinic. So when someone comes to my clinic with cough, my pretest probability for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a lot higher than it should be if someone comes to cough to the primary care physician's office, right? So there's a lot of nuance to that. But you have to choose the appropriate test once you've figured out your pretest probability. And then you have to be able to interpret that test and understand how it impacts that pretest probability. Um, one of the best ways to do this is by using likelihood ratios. And so likelihood ratios take the sensitivity and specificity, specificity of a test, and you can actually come up with a diagnostic weight that helps you figure out does the presence of that finding increase the probability of disease, decrease the probability of disease? And you can also think about does the absence of a finding change probability of disease? And so this is a, a nice example from Steve McGee's book, which you haven't read. It's just a wonderful book on all of the data behind the current physical exam that we do at the bedside. A likelihood ratio of one doesn't change probability at all, so that's not a helpful test. Likelihood ratio is greater than one increased probability of disease, less than one decreased probability of disease. And so, for example, let's say you have a patient who has abdominal dissension and you're worried, do they have ascites, right? And let's just imagine that the ultrasound machine's not working. You ran over the power cord with, with the bed and it, it broke or you didn't charge it or you don't know how to use it or you don't have one, right? Um, so here are all the findings that you could do looking for ascites. And what's really nice about Steve's book is that he takes away anything that doesn't shift the probability by 20% or more in either direction. And you're left with essentially three different findings. Do they have edema, yes or no? Because the presence of edema increases the likelihood, the absence of edema decreases the likelihood. Do they have flank tympani, right? Because fluid should be dependent. So if you have tympani here, there's probably no fluid along the sides. And then do they have a fluid wave? And those are the three things that I look for if the question is, does this patient have ascites? Has anyone heard of the puddle sign? Has anyone ever done the puddle sign? So the puddle sign is, it was my chief resident's favorite physical exam maneuver, and, and it's a, a way of detecting small amounts of ascites. And the way that you do this test, and this was first done on experiments in dogs and then repeated 
uh, with people. You have your patient lie prone for five minutes. Okay, so you're, the idea is you're allowing any acidic fluid to become dependent by their belly button. And then you get them on the ground on all fours. And then you crawl underneath them and you start flicking the side of their belly as you move the stethoscope around their belly, right? And so who are we doing this on, right? So you're doing this on patients in the hospital who have end-stage liver disease perhaps, might be encephalopathic, might be coagulopathic. And so my chief resident talked about this all the time. So one night we were around, it was like 8 o'clock at night, and I said, you talk about this all the time, can we just do that? Paul, show us how we do this, right? And so we get our patient on the ground, I get underneath him, and before I get my first little flick on the side, he just face plants. <laughs> his INR was five. We ended up having to call ENT to pack his nose. And then I looked at the data for the puddle sign. You know what the likelihood ratio for the puddle sign is? It's one. It's not helpful. So we don't teach the puddle sign. We don't do it, right? I think it's really important when you're approaching how you do the physical exam and how you teach it, don't focus on things that aren't going to help you make decisions, just like we don't order tests that don't help us make decisions, right? Um, so if we think the physical exam is important, we have to practice it, right? If we don't practice it, we're not going to get good at it. And so we need to create inten intentional opportunities to practice. And so the way that we've accessed this at Hopkins is by creating a curriculum that we initially called the Advancing Bedside Cardiopulmonary Physical Examination Skills Program, or ACE. So that's a long name for the program. The, the original name that we had to get rid of was Clinical Reasoning Applied to the Physical. Right, so that, I, I came up with I'm a pulmonologist, so we're not good at acronyms. Um, so what ACE is, is a series of activities with our interns. It starts out with some online simulations where we link physiology to physical exam findings. Occasionally we use the Harvey mannequin at the very beginning of the year to try to link certain um, palpable movements in the chest with heart sounds. Um, we do a lot of practice on healthy volunteers, which for the most part means myself and one of our other colleagues, Tim, who's, who's here. Um, but about 90% of our time is spent at the bedside with patients in the hospital where we can talk about how the findings on their exam and, and their history impact their care and affect decision making. Uh, and we've been able to show that this deliberate practice improves skill. So that cardiovascular exam I showed you um, that John Michael Crowley created, we gave that to our interns and we did it at the beginning of the year and then at the midpoint in the year after about half of them had gone through the curriculum. And only the folks who had gone through the curriculum improved their scores. And by the way, they also were better than our second year residents after going through this curriculum. Um, and this was mostly driven by uh, improvements in their auditory scores and their visual scores. So we know that intentional practice can at least improve skill in this one domain. The other thing that we've done is we've really tried to take make it explicit that the physical exam and the bedside exam is part of clinical reasoning. So we have a morning report that we started last year where if you want to present a case at morning report, you need two things. You need for the patient to still be in the hospital and you need for that patient to agree that we can go to the bedside and examine them after morning report. And so we have a typical report that you'd see at most residency programs, one of our faculties leading a discussion in clinical reasoning, and then afterwards we go to the bedside and we examine that patient. And we've kept track of how many times we go to the bedside and we see a difference or we change the way we would have formulated that case. Right now we're at about 20% of the time. Right? This happens all the time. The other thing that we try to do is recognize that time is limited. Right? We don't have a lot of time to spend with every patient to teach. But if you have five minutes, you can teach something about the physical examination. You can anchor it in the historical significance, where the maneuver came from. You can demonstrate proper technique and have a trainee demonstrate it back to you so you can make modifications and corrections. And then you give them the evidence behind that maneuver so they actually can leave the room saying, all right, I know what that is now. I can put that into practice and I know how that's going to change management. And this is something called the five minute moment that Stanford had created about four or five years ago. And if you have five minutes, you can do one of these. If you have 10 minutes, you can do two. You can add them up as building blocks together. So this is just one example on clubbing, right? So we, you know, yesterday in, in our noon conference, I kind of strung together like four or five of these five minute moments and we, we had a good intro to the pulmonary examination with a standardized patient. So the other thing we need to do, and I alluded to this before, is we need to recognize that the physical exam is not just about diagnosis and prognosis. It has power beyond its ability to, to diagnose disease. Um, and I think symbolism is really important. Um, this is a picture of Lenex. We've just celebrated the 200th anniversary of the creation of the stethoscope, which many people argue is the single greatest bedside diagnostic invention 
of all time. But some people have actually talked about how the stethoscope may have been actually the first chink in the armor of the doctor-patient relationship because for the first time, there was an inanimate object between ourselves and the patient. I look at it the other way. I think the stethoscope's great because at one end is the patient, at the other end is the physician, right? So it brings you closer together. But this is an interesting picture of Lenek who's got his monoral stethoscope in his left hand, but he's not using. He's actually engaged in direct auscultation. Um, and this symbolism is still powerful today, right? So everyone know who this is? And it's doc, Dr. McDreamy, right? So he, he's a neurosurgeon on TV. When was the last time you saw a neurosurgeon wearing a stethoscope around their neck, right? <laughs> but, and that's not, that, that, they don't need that tool, right? But that's how the public identifies a physician, right? This is Dr. Nick from The Simpsons. He's actually not a doctor, and you notice he has no stethoscope. But Dr. Hibbert, who is a doctor, who everyone likes, has a stethoscope. And then this is a good picture. This, this could be Mr. T, the scientist, right? But it's actually Mr. T, the doctor, because he's wearing his gold-plated stethoscope. And then if you just Google one of those like image, uh, stock images to see doctor, this is the one that comes up. So this guy, he's got a stethoscope here. He's got the biggest otoscope that I've ever seen. This is like a really intimidating doctor. This is what he's called. He's the serious senior doctor, right? Um, but the stethoscope as a symbol, I think, is under attack, right? You know, there's lots of, yeah, this has actually been true for the last 30 years. There have been articles creeping in about how the stethoscope is dying. It's a relic. We shouldn't use it anymore. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but most people would agree that if the stethoscope is truly under siege, it's because of technology. And I think technology can be a powerful lever to get people back to the bedside. So I wanted to ask you, and I know you guys have a, a really good ultrasound program that's starting with, with the house staff. How often are you using portable ultrasound to make decisions or to, to modify encounters at the bedside? I wish I could hide this so you can't see each other's. And I would say this over the last two, three years that I've been talking at, at different programs about this, these numbers have started to dramatically shift. It used to be 60 to 70 percent of the time was never and only a few times with some. So we're starting to have traction here with, with portable ultrasound. And, you know, point of care technology is amazing. That picture that I showed you earlier of all of us going to the bedside at morning report, we were using a digital stethoscope so that 10 people at the same time could listen as we looked at the carotids to time systole, right? So I knew that everyone was hearing exactly what I was hearing, and I think it's a much more effective way to teach. But point of care ultrasound, you can teach physiology in real time. You can calibrate your physical exam skills. There are some things that the ultrasound machine can pick up that you probably can't pick up with your own skills. But I think perhaps the most important part about bedside ultrasound is that if you want to use it, you have to go to the bedside. You have to go be with the patient, and you have to take down their gown and actually touch their chest, touch their back. And when you do that, you find things, right? And so we're very interested in studying how does the ultrasound change the way we interface with patients, both in terms of time, but also in terms of other skills. And so I think that's something that I'm going to share with you we're going to be studying. Um, so this is David Lickman. So he's one of our ultrasound educators, and he runs our procedural service. And so if you want to do a central line or a paracentesis or a thoracentesis at our hospital attending resident, you have to be credentialed by David. He has to watch you do a certain number of those exams and say that you're safe to do it. And we do this with good reason, right? A central line done poorly can lead to a life-threatening infection. You can have a pneumothorax. You can have damage to the carotid artery. You could kill somebody, right? I would argue the same is true about the physical exam. A physical exam done poorly, misinterpreted or not done at all, leads to diagnostic error and can be life-threatening. So I ask you guys, how many times in the last year have you been given feedback about your physical exam skills? And I don't mean on an electronic form. I mean, someone watched you do an exam and said to you, hey, that was odd how you did that. Let me help you to get a little bit better, right? And so I think this is a trend that is very common across the country, right? The vast majority of us have not been observed at the bedside. And so this is what the ACGME says about this. So in their milestone, patient care one, if you're ready for unsupervised practice, you have to perform the accurate physical exam that's targeted to a patient's complaint. You have to effectively use history and physical examination skills to minimize the need for further diagnostic testing. 
Well, if we're not watching people do the physical examination, how are we making determinations about this? So in our clinical competency committee, sometimes I joke that, well, I think she's good at the neuro exam because she's the only intern on service for the last month that has a reflex hammer, right? Or they must be good at the cardiac examination because they talked so eloquently on rounds about the murmur that none of us listened to, right? So they must know what they're talking about, right? And so I think that's a real problem and an opportunity. So we've been inspired by what they do in the UK. So graduating residents in the UK, if they want to go on to the next level of training, they have to pass a summative high stakes exam. It's a two hour test where they rotate through five stations and they encounter eight patients. Six of those patients are real patients with real findings on exam. And they do those encounters in front of faculty member who themselves that day examine the patient and agree these are the findings that are present. This is what a graduating resident should be able to do. And this is how they should interpret these findings. And the first time pass rate for this assessment is only about 65%. And so what happens in the UK is first year of medical school, they form pace of study groups where on Friday afternoons, I worked at a hospital in Malaysia for a year, and they, they studied for the MRCP. Every Friday, the med students would go to the bedside and they would quiz each other on physical exam findings. And they would get really good at doing a cardiac exam in five minutes or less, doing a really smooth, targeted neurologic examination, right? There are centers in the UK that you actually can pay a few thousand dollars and for the weekend go examine 30 patients in front of master clinicians to get better at your skills because this is a high stakes exam. Now, there's no opportunity for that in the United States. There's no appetite for that here. That ship sailed in the 1970s for a number of reasons. But I think if we want to get better at the exam, if we think it's important, we need to assess those skills. And so inspired by what they do in the UK, we came up with a formative assessment that we're calling APEX, or um, the Assessment of Physical Examination Communication Skills. And it looks very similar to what they do in the UK with two exceptions. The first is that one of our stations is an integrated ultrasound station where you first get to examine a patient, you talk about what those findings are with the faculty, and then we explicitly ask the intern, if you had an ultrasound machine right now, what would you look for? And then we give them an ultrasound machine and we see if they can actually do that, which they said would be important, okay? But the most important part of this is that after they go through the five stations and encounter the eight patients, and in our exam it's seven real patients with real findings, they then go back for an hour and they get dedicated feedback one-on-one -on -one with the faculty where it's hands-on, here's the water hammer pulse that you missed, here's the PMI that you missed, here's how to do an ankle reflex that you weren't able to elicit. So everyone leaves the day with better skills than what they had. This is allowing us to collect data on skills that we've never had before. Right? And so we have nine clinical domains that we're assessing over the course of these eight patient encounters. So exam technique, interpreting findings, differential diagnosis, ultrasound technique. And it's going to allow us to begin to study how the, how the changes in physical examination skill or the impact of our program then impacts other things downstream that I'll share with you. So this is just an example. All these patients have allowed us to share their pictures with us. This is one of my patients from the interstitial lung disease clinic. He was our first pulmonary patient. He's since graduated, he got a lung transplant, so we don't allow 10 people to examine him anymore. Um, but after we examine them, we have one-on-one -on -one feedback. We've learned a ton about ourselves as a program and also where the pulse, if you were the physical exam is by doing this, right? So here's some opportunities for improvement. People would use the stethoscope first and listen through the gown. They wouldn't remove the gown at all. They would use the radial pulse to time the cardiac cycle. They were doing oral exams without a light. I don't know what they were possibly hoping to accomplish. Or they were just unsystematic and hesitant, right? So I see a lot of people wearing their stethoscopes around their necks. I, I don't do that because I know where my stethoscope has been. I do, I do clean it, though. Um, but a lot of interns will do what I call stethoscope jump roping, right? They'll take it off. They don't know what they're going to do with it. They put it back on. Then they take it off again. Then they put it back on, right? So the fluency that comes with practice, practicing this is not there. And these opportunities for improvement in technique lead to missed findings, right? So if you don't take down the gown, you're going to miss the mastectomy scars that are actually the clue to why this patient has cough from radiation fibrosis, or you miss the PMI in a patient with heart failure, or you miss time the murmur and you think that what well, was a systolic murmur was diastolic and vice versa. You miss the drug advantage pressure if you're not looking for it. And my personal favorite, if we got to the hospital right now, I guarantee you every note or 90% of, 95% of the notes in, in the hospital today would say, no clubbing, cyanosis, or edema. So we brought in a patient who had clubbing, cyanosis, and edema. 
and 90% of people missed it, right? Because they didn't look for it, right? Um, our trainees love it. So when we ask them to compare the feedback they get during this assessment compared to the feedback they get on their skills elsewhere, along the lines of is it personal, accessible, timely, credible, and useful, this type of assessment blows it away and they want more of it. And I think perhaps the, the most important thing that we've learned is that this is a great way to build community. So we've now done this um, for two years. We're in our second year. We've had about 150 interns go through this over the last two years. Um, and we've had to build up a group of faculty examiners who are confident in their ability to go to the bedside and assess a patient and then give someone feedback on it. And so we now have about 40 faculty across our institution and then faculty who are visiting from other institutions to, to learn how to do this. And that's been a really, really great byproduct of it. Because of the work that we've done to start assessing skills rigorously, we're now in a position where we can study the impact of improvements in physical exam skill on outcomes. And so we've been very fortunate. We partnered with University of Alabama and Stanford University. They were two of the founding institutions along with Wake Forest of our Society of Bedside Medicine, and we successfully competed for an AMA Reimagining Residency Award. And what we're going to be doing during this award is we're going to be looking at modifiable aspects of the training environment, linking those modifiable aspects to important outcomes like clinical skill and stress and burnout. You're looking at both depersonalization as well as professional fulfillment. And we're going to be able to use data to drive interventions to improve the way that we train residents and the way that we provide patient care. And so I wanted to give you, um, I don't know what just happened. <laughs> How are we doing on time? I'm doing okay. Um, so I wanted to give you a sense of what we're going to be looking at, right? So for the last year or so, we've been asking the question, well, how do our interns spend their time in the hospital? And so the iCompare study, which just came out that, that our program director was one of the leads of, they did about 2,000 hours of observation of interns to figure out that they spend about 12% of their time with patients. But that cost a lot of money, and it took a lot of time. So we've given our interns these infrared tracking badges, which are the same badges that our nurses wear on the floors and the same badges that we use to track IV pumps and, and expensive equipment. And we've collected over 100,000 hours of data. And what you can see here, this is the time of day on the x-axis and then the minutes spent in each location. You can see how we're spending time at the patient room, so there's an uptick during rounds. But the vast majority of our time is spent in the team room, in the hallway, and in sort of the nursing station, right? So even during bedside rounds at the birthplace of modern bedside medicine, most of our rounds are probably happening in the hallway, right? And so we're going to be able to take this data. We're going to be able to see, do interventions that we put into place change how we spend our time and then look at how that impacts clinical skill and burnout. At the same time, we know we spend a lot of time on the computer. We can use the EHR to understand behavior. Right, so this is one intern's behavior in the EHR over a period of about a month. And you can see where she's spending her time in notes and letters and the indexes in clinical review. We can figure out how many messages people are responding to, how many orders they're entering, the types of orders they're entering, and how much time overall they spend on the computer. We can also tell if they're logging in from the hospital or if they're logging in at home. Right? So, this is something we haven't been able to track with our tracking badges. We don't know how people are spending their time outside of the hospital. And I know in my clinic, you know, most of my notes are written between the hours of 8 p.m. and 1 a.m., right? That's when I finish my clinic notes. Um, and I think that's an important thing to study. Um, we're not doing this work alone, right? And so everything that I've shared with you has been a group effort that really started when we went out to the Stanford Clinical Skills Symposium back in 2015. Um, that's where I met Hal and Tom DuBose here, and that's how we started our partnership with Wake Forest. Um, that's coming up in a few weeks, actually, out in Palo Alto. If you have an opportunity to go this year, it's an amazing conference. But if you can't go this year, come next year, because it's really about building community and about practicing hands-on skills that you can bring back to your own practice and bring back to your own program. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you that the physical exam is still important. I think based on what I've seen here the last two days, I know that you already believe that. Um, deliberate practice improves skill. Technology is a powerful lever to get people back to the bedside to enhance that skill. Assessment drives learning. If we care about this stuff, we have to assess it. And we also need to look at outcomes. We need to know how changing clinical skill impacts patient care, cost of care, diagnostic error, stress and burnout. Um, and I'll end just with what it means for me to be at the bedside. 
So I play guitar as well as uh, practice lung medicine. Um, and the best pulmonary function test I've ever done was jamming with this veteran for about 30 minutes. He was here with a COPD exacerbation, but he has harmonica there. After this, I was like, okay, man, you're good to go. You can go home. <laughs> so, so I'll stop there and take any questions that you have. And, and thank you again for the invitation to speak. and also um, took me back about 40 years <laughs> when I was at Hopkins, and that'll be my second question. But my first question is I don't think I heard you address the issue of the history. Yes. So the history is obviously important. Um, I think our avenue into coming into this and trying to get people back to the bedside, you know, we, we do a really good job of teaching the history to our medical students. Um, and I think that's one of the great benefits of having standardized patient programs and the ability to practice in non-threatening environments and be able to get lots of feedback. So I, I think our trainees, when they arrive, are actually very good at taking a history, and, and our APEX data has shown that they're actually very good at their clinical communication skills, managing patient concerns. But I think where things have fallen off is actually the technique at the bedside. And so that was our first foray into this, was with the physical exam and assessing those skills. Now that we're starting to collect data on history, I think we're going to start to understand better where there might be opportunities to even improve that focus history. What we've learned, um, and I know that you're doing this work here as well, you know, simply the way we communicate about the history, the way that we formulate a problem representation, the way that we then use that to access an illness script or to think about our differential diagnosis, I think that's something that has not been as emphasized as it could be in, me in medical school, and so I think that might be an area where we're going to continue to work on, mostly through our morning report, where we can spend time thinking about how that person presented and how we would formulate the, those facts. But it's still critically important. You're absolutely right. And then my second question also takes me back, but also your picture of William Mosler. And I, I only spent four years at Hopkins before I came here to start the experiment in aging here. Um, <clears throat> But it, in looking at that, it took me back to my time at Hopkins when I had the sense that William Mosley was t t in the halls at night, <laughs> drawing about the halls, because that was the idea. What is, so there was something about Hopkins that was very special. And I have compared my four years at Hopkins to adding a crystal to a, a, a super saturated solution. Things happened so fast, and there were so much, many things happening all at once that there was something about the constellation and the coming together. Is that still true at Hopkins? Absolutely. You know, I, I think um, you know we're, we are very blessed, and and you know we we are in such a, an environment that is rich in bedside medicine, and it's something that's embraced by our trainees. It's something that our program director believes in. It's something that our chairman of medicine believes in. He still rounds with us uh, every Friday. Um, so I think we, we recognize that tradition, and, and we also recognize the, the weight of that trend, you know, of, of that history. And, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to examine what's been happening in our program, because we believe that we are a bedside medicine program, but yet we know that if we look at the skills of our second year residents, they're no better than graduating medical students, right? And I think that's a problem, and I think it's, it's our responsibility to figure out ways to innovate and to address that problem. But I think it's also part of our responsibility to partner with others and figure out how can we address these issues in a way that's going to impact other training programs. And so that's, that was the impetus behind starting the Society of Bedside Medicine. That was the reason that our, our AMA grant was intentionally designed to have four residency programs as opposed to just us because I think these are, these are problems that everyone's having, and, and I think we're in a position where we have a, a chance to address them. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks so much. Great talk and, and topic. I liked what you said about the sort of what happens after the exam, the thought process behind things, and really applying the physical exam findings to clinical reasoning. And oftentimes with presentations, it's just sort of a data dump of here's the whole exam. And then the interpretation comes way at the end after the labs and the radiology and those sorts of things. And so we're not linking our, our exam findings to how they will influence our actions. So are you all changing the way that 
maybe that presentation even occurs to sort of bring some of the thought process. How, how are you addressing incorporating that, the clinical reasoning of the exam findings? Yeah, so the, the first step in that was the way that we reconfigured our morning report to, to explicitly state that these findings are important and to show that many of the times what was presented in report is very different than what was actually happening with the patient. And that gives us an opportunity to then say, okay, based on what we now know, now that we've spent time with the patient, how would we reformulate that problem representation? How does that change our differential diagnosis? I think there's also an opportunity to really study this. Um, so I know here at your program, people are working on looking at how people reason by looking at their notes, right? And to see, you know, maybe there's something about the way people document that will change as a function of them spending more time with patients and recognizing the value of this. I think that's an area where I'm hoping to collaborate on because I, I hope that it's changing. I feel that it's changing on rounds when I hear people present. And it's not just when I'm attending, it's when I kind of sneak around and watch what's going on in wards. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to measure that and to be more explicit about it. Because again, you know, we want to focus on the things that matter. If that physical exam finding doesn't change the likelihood of disease, then we probably don't need to spend time talking about it. Just like we don't talk about everything that's happened to a patient, we have to edit down to the information that we think is relevant. Hi, Brian. Um, thank you for an amazing and uh, inspiring talk. I was um, very pleased to hear that there were 40 people engaged in this curriculum, and um, I was wondering what was the key to, to that? You know, how does your institution appreciate those master clinicians, and how does that happen? Yeah, so it, we built that over the last two and a half years. So we started out when we first did this, when we first started doing these assessments, it was myself and two other faculty members. And we were just doing one patient at a time, and we'd bring in you know six or seven interns over the course of an afternoon. And little by little, we started asking people, hey, can you volunteer a half day of your time to do this? Um, when we, when we do about eight of these per year, and so it's 16 half day sessions. And so people are, have been really excited to come for a half day or two half days. And then once they come, once they see what we've done, once they meet our patients who are volunteering so much of their time to be a part of us, and once they see how excited the interns and engaged they are after this, most people have asked us to come back. So we're actually now in a position where we're turning people away because we have too many faculty members for certain assessment days. Um, but it's taken about two and a half years to do this. And like many things, we've done it by asking people to help us but we don't offer them any money. We give them lunch and, and parking if they come from another hospital. Um, but we do have some, we do have a full-time nurse who we've been able to hire through both the AMA grant and another um, donor that actually supports our work. Um, so we have a full-time nurse who helps recruit the patients, who does all the organization for the faculty schedules and the resident schedules. And then she's the most organized person in the history of the world, which allows us to really run this seamlessly and to make sure she has backups for our backups, right? Because these are real patients and oftentimes they get sick and they can't make it. And we have yet to have a day where we haven't been able to have patients with real findings at all of the stations. I think there's someone in the back now. Uh, it's a wonderful talk. I agree with Claudia. Uh, but I'm just trying to figure out on the ground practically how long the ground lasts given electronic medical records and all the needs of documentation, how long is the workday for residents? Well, so the workday, there's lots of things that go into the workday for residents, which I think has, has led to a lot of tension, right? So residents don't work as many hours as they used to. They're taking care of, for the most part, the same number of patients, although there's a higher length of stay, so there's more turnover, right? So there's a lot of work pressures that we've compressed. Um, so we've had to, to make some changes to our teaching services. Um, when I was chief resident, we would have 30 patients on service uh, for the chief residents. We've actually cut that down to 20 um, so that we can spend time at the bedside with particularly our new patient admissions um, to model that behavior at the bedside. But, but it is true, you know, if, if you practice and have a choreography to the way that you approach rounds, and that's something that Peter Lickstein has done here, it doesn't take longer to spend time in the room with the patient and I think the information that you get is much richer. The ability to engage in shared decision making is there. And you don't have to go back as many times to re-update the patient on the plan or to go back and ask that question that you wish you had had time to ask when you were standing out in the hall. So I think there's this misconception that spending time at the bedside somehow 
makes the work longer. I think it makes it more fulfilling, and I, I think there's data to show that it actually doesn't take more time if you have a plan and if you practice it, right? That's, you have to practice doing this. It's just like anything else. If you, if you don't round at the bedside, you're not going to be as efficient at doing it, and you're not going to get the information that you need to make those decisions. So I have a question about uh, any change in the teaching of physical examination of medical students over the years versus interns coming in or residents' uh, skills at the time they present on awards. I mean, has, been, has there been a declination in, in uh, teaching physical examination in the medical school? So I don't think so. So many schools, or I think most schools have something akin to what we have, which is a clinical foundations in medicine course where you get paired with a faculty member is going to be with you longitudinally for a year or so, and they're the person that kind of shepherds you through your first exposure to the clinical exam, both on standardized patients and then going into the hospital to see real patients. What I think has changed is that the gap is much more noticeable between when you learn those skills and then when you go to the hospital and you don't practice them, right? Because, you know, second year students are pretty good at physical exam on standardized patients. But then they get to the hospital and they see people just typing away on their computers and making decisions from the electronic health record, not using the information that's available to make the clinical decisions that could be made faster and easier and more efficiently without the computer. And so those skills atrophy. So by the time they get to intern year, they haven't done a neurologic examination in two years. They don't know how to do an ankle reflex because they don't remember. They don't know how to auscultate because they haven't done it. Right? Um, so I don't think the med school intro to the clinical skills has changed, but the hospital environment has changed such that in third and fourth year, they don't practice it and they don't see that behavior being modeled. And I think that's why for us, it made more sense to focus on the residency program first. If we can change the culture in the residency program, change the way that we round and change the way that we approach the physical exam, the students will come with those basic skills and then they'll put them into practice so that when they come to internship, they'll have seen what a, a true hypothesis-driven physical exam can accomplish. And I guess the second part, the electronic medical record versus the old handwritten chart uh, that people have not experienced, if you're not as old as Bill or I, to have dealt with those things. I, mean, I, 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 tried, I train with paper charts. Yeah, because you, you spend a lot of time, if you're going to document as well as you should be documenting, you take a lot of time in the chart handwriting everything, it's, and it's, it's not a very good way to do things. The EMR potentially has some time savings there, especially if you can't find the chart, charts off with the patient someplace else, yeah. you have to delay what your documentation is. But anyway, it's just one of my concerns about the EMR may be more helpful than the old handwritten charts ever were. Yeah, I don't think we've realized the promise of electronic health records. You know, they were created to capture billing, they weren't created to capture the narrative of the patient, and they weren't created to capture the way that we think. And I think that for me, when I'm, when I'm writing notes, I think the biggest change for me from handwriting the notes to be able to type and check boxes is that it's easier for me to get that note done without actually stopping to think about what it is that I hope to accomplish and what it is that I think is going on. And I think there are going to be ways as we start addressing the HR, maybe some of it's going to be with augmented intelligence or artificial intelligence, if you will, voice dictation. We just started using Dragon with Epic, which I think has cut down on a lot of people's time to document an Epic. I think we're going to be able to remove some of those barriers of how it is to document now in the HR so that we can realize the benefits of doing things more efficiently, having the data available when you need it, and not having to track down a chart somewhere. Although, most of the time, the chart's with the patient, right? Which is a good thing, right? Hey, I found you. How are you doing? Okay, let me borrow your chart. Oh, you don't look so good. Let's, uh, let's spend some more time with you. I mean, I think that, that magic of pre-rounding, that doesn't happen anymore. We know from data at Stanford and, and our data, pre-rounding happens in the office. So we're not seeing patients as much as we used to, and, and I think we're missing things because of that. I think we have time for one more question. All right, if there are no further, oh, oh Dr. Atkinson, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you again for uh, a great presentation. Uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but you know, one of the things that we see is sort of this hidden curriculum that the physical examination really doesn't have value. That, you know, we, we try to teach them, we have committed faculty, you put them through the, your version of the PACES exam, but then they get out on the, on the floor and the attending physician sometimes maybe doesn't place the, the value on the physical exam. How do we create a culture with faculty, not just those that are passionate yeah. about it, 
uh, where we actually are continually improving our skills for physical exam because we know that you know from third year medical school to you know faculty level we actually don't see a lot of improvement in those skills how do we continue to advance and improve and deliberately practice as faculty members yeah for us that the answer to that has been setting up that assessment system we now have a group of faculty who are more confident in their ability to teach and who we actually have watched perform physical examinations with other faculty have gotten feedback on their own skills and those are the faculty by and large who are the teaching hospitalists who we have a firm faculty system of people who support the chief residents and cover those services and so we're intentional about who we invite to be a part of this because we know that those are the people who have the face time in front of the house staff um, and so that that's been our avenue into that question here but i think it really just starts with going to the bedside with patients and things happen when you do bedside rounds i think i shared the story the other day we had a, a patient who had hepatic encephalopathy who the resident said oh this she's not able to speak to us right now she just didn't take her lactulose well, let's do this one in the hallway i'm like no we're going to do it in the room and we get in the room and every 10 seconds she would do this <sighs> but she did nothing else for the next 10 seconds she was breathing five times a minute right that's not how people with hepatic encephalopathy breathe right so we're like hey can we get some narcan and we gave her the Narcan. She sat bolt upright. Where's my daughter? I was like, ma'am, did you take something? She's like, I guess I took too much methadone. Right? And that doesn't happen. That lady would have been sitting on the wards for another six hours before someone had come back and seen her and figured that out, right? And the residents who were on the team that day, they're never going to forget that. They're never going to forget the value of spending time just watching someone. Um, and I think those little experiences, little by little, just like the demand you guys have created for ultrasound, is going to be something that the residents want and desire. That's going to drive faculty behavior to get better at ultrasound. I think the same is true with the basic bedside physical exam skills that we all want to have. Well, Dr. Gary, I want to thank you for an amazing presentation. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone.